Hello everyone. Happy Saturday. A balmy Saturday, about 26 degrees here in eastern Ontario. So a little, uh, little under, out, of the, uh, out of the normal, but lovely nonetheless. Thank you all for joining me for my fourth and final installment of this Instagram Live series, September Saki Saturdays with me, Psalm for All. Wow. You know, it's a little bit hard to believe that, you know, we've already reached the end here. You know, despite all the craziness that's going on in the world today, I do feel, you know, sometimes that time itself seems to pass kind of quickly. Um, you know, uh, you know, feels just like yesterday that we started talking about the, our, the first sake, our first table sake, that futsushu. Yet, you know, in a blink of an eye, seemingly, here we are at episode number four. Now, for those of you who may have missed episodes one, two, and or three, no need to worry. You can find them all posted to IGTV, as well as on my Psalm for All Facebook page and, of course, my Psalm for All YouTube channel. Now, as we usually do, let's get, we're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. As Saki is an alcoholic product, I do need to ask that if there's anybody that's watching this episode or any of the other episodes, but specifically this one, that if you're not of the legal age where you can legally consume and purchase alcohol where you live, no matter where that is in the world, that it's time for you to say goodbye. Um, so what does that exactly mean? I live here in Ontario. In Ontario, you must be 19 years or older to legally purchase and or consume alcohol. So if there's anyone watching in Ontario, you need to be 19 years or older. Copacetic? All right. Next, let's just do a quick recap of last week, episode three. I started off by talking about what happens to the portions of rice uh, grains that are sanded away or polished away, the technical term. Anyone recall how they're used? I had a couple of examples. Anyone? Anyone? Give you a couple more seconds. Virtual gears are turning. Smelling virtual smoke coming out of ears. Five, four, three, two, and one. So if anyone said that they're used, that those grain leftovers are used in livestock feed, Japanese pickles, and or Japanese crackers, very good, well done, you're paying attention, gold star. All right, I also chatted about what you can use to serve your sake and, you know, the background of, you know, the flask called the tokori and the cup called the oshoko. We also discussed serving temperatures of sake and, you know, the cautions that you need to follow when you're heating your sake. And finally, we tasted two different styles last week, a draft sake and a nagori style sake. So last week was quite the jam-packed episode. Today, there's a lot going on, but it's a little bit lighter. So in episode one, I outlined sake production in a very broad and general sense, and that was done by design. You know, there's one element of the production cycle that I've saved for this final episode, and that's, a, that's the, the part of a pasteurization. And the use of pasteurization, or even the omittance of pasteurizing sake, and how it plays key roles in sake styles and profiles. So a quick summary. Pasteurization, it's a process named um, for the French microbiologist Louis Pasteur, whereby foods are treated to mild degrees of heat in an effort to essentially eliminate germs and bacteria. Now, this is done to prevent the product from spoiling, so whether it's liquid or otherwise, uh, and also to, to extend the shelf life of the product. With regards to sake, you know, they're generally pasteurized twice, so two times once before being put into storage tanks, and the second during the bottling stage. Now, this said, depending on the style that's being produced, uh, some sakis follow a different path. Remember, I said generally, right? The bunny ears, generally. Generally, they're both pasteurized twice. So, some types of sake are only pasteurized once, either before going into that tank storage. You know, these are called nama shozo, or they're pasteurized only once just before bottling. Those are called namazumi. Uh, and then, you know, there's also sakis that skip pasteurization completely, and these are called namasaki um, with a Z. So you'd say namazaki or Z, I guess, if you're in the U.S., to, my, to Lenny and Jane who may be watching. So that would be not namaziki, namazaki, but with a Z, Z up here. Okay. So you now may be wondering, why would sake be either single pasteurized or not pasteurized at all? 
That's a very good question. And the answer lies with the style being produced and the end result that the brewmaster is trying to achieve. You see, the less a sake is pasteurized, the fresher, brighter, and more lively the flavors and aromas become. However, with, you know, with pasteurization not happening at all, refrigeration becomes very key here in order to retain that freshness. If a, a namazaki, that's the unpasteurized style, if you store that at room temperature for even just a few days, you know, it's gonna turn cloudy, it's essentially gonna spoil. The product's gonna be sour, it's gonna be a miserable experience and not very pleasant on the palate whatsoever. So, namazakis, you want to refrigerate. Pa so, all that said, pasteurization plays a very crucial role in the style of sake that's being made. And in a little bit, we're gonna explore that just a touch more. In the three prior episodes, I've tasted sake products that were produced in both Japan and in California. The Kali sake was uh, in episode one, that was our table sake, the futsushu we did in episode one. Japan itself remains the leading country for sake production. There's just about a thousand sake producers in Japan currently. However, sake popularity has, you know, has really grown globally and other countries are making sake. So China, Southeast Asia, South America, and the aforementioned US of A all have sake production. But I'm wondering if it would surprise any of you out there to know that here in Canada, we also have sake producers. Yes, folks, the True North Strong and Free actually boasts three sake breweries, two in the west of the country in British Columbia, Artisan Sake Maker and Nipro Brewing. Those are the two that are out west. And right here, well, not right here, but right here in Ontario area, we have Ontario Spring Water Company based in Toronto's distillery district. So in the downtown part of Toronto in the distillery district. For today's tasting, very special treat, I have two of their sakis. Try not to break the bar, two of their sakis. Now the Ontario Spring Water Company is Eastern North America's first sake brewer and was established in 2011 with a lot of help and guidance from Japan's Miyasaka Brewing Company. Miyasaka itself dates back to the 1600s, so you know, those are good folks to talk to. They know a thing or two about making sake. Fresh Northern Ontario spring water is used in the production of the Junmai style of sakis that the Ontario Spring Water Company makes. Um, which, you know, and again, talking Junmai, they only make the Junmai style. And Junmai, again, quick refresher, it means that the sake has been sanded to 70%, or the what we call the R RPR, rice polishing ratio, is at 70%. So 70% of the rice grain is intact. With Ontario spring Water Company Sake, the East June Mai's are either pasteurized or unpasteurized. You know, they boast being the only source for unpasteurized sake in both Ontario and they're claiming even throughout the Eastern Seaboard as a whole. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, and my research uh, stands up to that. I haven't found anybody else yet that does that, uh, unpasteurized sake. So pretty cool stuff happening here in Ontario. Today, I'm tasting their Junmai Gensu style sake, as well as their Junmai Namacho sake. As recommended by the brewer, I'm tasting both of these at slightly chilled temperatures. Again, that's a little subjective, um, you know, you can. I would not recommend either of these styles being heated though. I think it'll go sideways on you. Uh, I don't think anything good will come of that. If you want to try it, that's fine, but just know Psalm for All says these should be that slightly chilled. I wouldn't even go room temperature. Um, just to, to really enjoy what the brewer master was trying to achieve here. Genshu sake, this guy right here, is an undiluted sake. So most sakis have an alcohol by volume of about 20% when they're finished. And then what they do is to get it down to that 15 to 17% ratio that we've talked about a few times as a general rule, they, they add some water to get it down to that 15 to 17%. Um, Genshu sake, so they're not diluted at all. Now, this said, another little asterisk caveat here, all Gensus are not 20% ABV. Um, there's some production techniques that can be used when making sake, such as fermenting at a lower temperature or, you know, stopping the fermentation early. You know, that can lead to the alcohol by volume being a little lower than 20 without adding water. 
And I think that's the case with this guy. We're going to see it. He's at 17.5. So some characteristics that we would expect from a Genshu style sake would be more rich and powerful display of both aromas and flavors. Um, you know, this bottle right here from Ontario's own Ontario, Toronto's own Ontario Spring Water Company. It's a 375 milliliter bottle. And again, it clocks in at 17.5%. So what's it look like? Well, we'll move this guy over here. See, you know, it's clear. It's got a touch of a yellow hue. <clears throat> uh, initial aromas are indeed a bit bold uh, on the nose. You know, there's definitely, there's definitely a, a, a bit of a cooked rice note in there, uh, but there's also some good fruit in there. You know, I'm getting some, some pear, I get some peach, some yellow apple. You know, those all come through. There's a little bit of white flower, so some floral. Uh, I'm thinking maybe like lily, jasmine. You know, and there's, there's a touch of almond in there. So, pretty nice. Let's go in for a taste. On the palate, you know, it's a bit punchy. It's not boozy. You know, it's not hot, it's not boozy, but it, you know, it's punchy. This grabs this type of sake, or this sake in particular, grabs your attention. Um, the almond, for me, and uh, and, the, and macadamia nuts seem to really jump out. Um, I get some of that rice again, that rice grain, and then those those peach and pear and yellow apple notes. You know, they all come through. This really wakes up your uh, really wakes up your palate, though, but in a good way. In a good way. Okay. So, very nice. Put him over here. As we let the car run by. Live, live Instagram, folks. Uh, all right, so next we're gonna move on to Namasho. So the Namasho Saki, 15.5% alcohol by volume. And again, this is a 375 milliliter bottle. This guy has only seen a one-time pasturation and it was done just before bottling. So if you remember a few moments ago, we were talking about pasteurization and what you can expect depending at what point the pasteurization was done, if at all. So done just before bottling, um, you know, that's going to, uh, to lend itself to, to a unique profile. Clear, colorless, you know, uh, on the nose. Hmm, very nice. You know, it, it's, it's very delicate. Um, you know, certainly more delicate than the, the Jensu, uh, and it actually smells fresh. Interestingly enough, I get some banana, uh, some baking spice, so clove, nutmeg. I get some fruit. I get a little bit of cantaloupe, um, you know, and some floral notes. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. Let's go in for a taste. So on the palate, light, it's bright, it's fresh, um, you know, very clean. And there's just a little bit of acidity. So my mouth is watering a little bit in the back end. I can pick up on that. Very nice. Banana, certainly as a flavor comes through, but it's a bit more muted than, than on the nose. Um, pear, soft apple, some nuttiness all come through. Um, you know, I'm not tasting the, the baking spice. I'm not really getting the clove or the nutmeg uh, on the palate. What I am getting is all very well balanced. Quite, quite tasty, quite tasty. So what are my thoughts on these guys? Well, keeping in mind, I am not affiliated with the Ontario Spring Water Brewing Company. Um, so I'm not a rep and you know, this is just my, my assertions here. Um, but you know, I like them both. They're very different, but I do like them both. A word of caution, though, I would not suggest if you're a novice to sake or new to sake to start with these guys. Um, you know, I'd rather I, I'd rather you wait until you've tried some of the other styles that we uh, that we've talked about over the last uh, th four weeks. Um, you know, it's not to say that um, that these are are bad by any stretch. Again, I like them; they're very good. I think they're very good examples of the styles. But I think in order to appreciate what the, what the aromas are and what the mouthfeel is and what the flavors, I think that your, your palate needs to be a little used to sake 
before you, you dive in, especially the Jinsu. Um, you know, excellent, don't get me wrong, but if you start with this and you're a novice, I think it may scare you away with its bold profile. So, now the Ontario Springwater Jensu Saki, this guy here, when you're ready to dive into it, $17.95 in Ontario at the LCBO, stock number 13405, and that's for a 375 milliliter bottle. The more delicate, fresh, only pasteurized once style, Nama Show from Ontario Spring Water. Again, 375 milliliter bottle, $16.50, and can be found at the LCBO, stock number 571109. You can also check out the website for Ontario Spring Water at www.ontariosaki.com. And you know, there you'll see the full list of all the different products and the pricing that they have online. So, Ginchu, no mushu. Before we wrap up this last installment of September Saki Saturdays with Psalm for All, let's talk quickly about Saki and food. As with wine, food pairings can be very subjective. You know, we know that. Same, you know, same with beer, um, food and wine. You, know, you like what you like. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, Saki is indeed very food friendly on its own. You know, I thought maybe I'd just give you some pointers. I mean, I wouldn't take these as hard and fast rules because, again, there's that subjectivity that's in there, but just some pointers and some general guidelines beyond what most people know or when they've had sake the first time. Usually there's sushi or ramen or tempura. I mean, those are the classic pairings. You can't go wrong there. But beyond that, you know, we talked about the straight up Junmai style, um, you know, and it tends to have a bit of a rice profile. We talked about that in, in prior episodes. So, you know, the Jun Mai style, just Jun Mai on the bottle, that would work well with rice dishes, of course, and it would also work well with risotto. So a nice creamy risotto would work well with the Jun Mai. For sake styles like Jingo and Dai Jingo, or Jingo and Big Jingo, Dai Jingo, those sakis, if you recall, tend to have more of a fruit forward profile, more fruit forward components. And, you know, as such, you know, they would be great as aperitifs um, or, you know, enjoyed with food. I would suggest lighter fare options like fish, specifically white fish, um, or you know if you're if you're sticking with um, you know East Asian cuisine, you know chop suey would work fine with that as well. Now, when you combine jun mai with dai jingo, that's going to pair pretty well with um, you know more acidic type dishes and um, you know and spicy dishes. I'm going to throw out pizza. Uh, and I know it sounds a bit funny, but depending on the type of pizza you have, the tomato sauce and that acidity is going to go very well with those floral notes, um, and it's going to get very well balanced, or should, with the Junmai Dai Jingo. Again, depending on what you're putting on your pizza, of course. Uh, and then again, spicy dishes. So Thai, barbecue peanuts, anything with a bit of zip to it, Junmai Dai Jingo is going to pair well. You know, it should. <laughs> Namasakis. Ah, namazaki. So either those are the either partially or fully pasteurized sakis. They've got that fresh profile that we were just talking about, and they tend to pair well with cheese, with shrimp, with barbecue dishes, and not barbecue in terms of spice, but, you know, barbecue in terms of, of southern U.S. barbecue, um, and then and chicken. Um, so, some, some options there. And then finally, nigori sake. We had one of those last week. Um, you know, it was in that pink bottle. It was creamy. It was cloudy. Very delicate as well. And the Nagori Sakis would go very nicely with quality milk chocolate. Um, so again, chocolate desserts, milk chocolate on its own, that should, that should work well together. You know, but hey, look, these are just guidelines. Don't take my word for it. You know, I encourage you all to try different dishes with different styles and really to find your own favorite pairings. You know, it, it's, it's whatever you like. That's the most important thing. So now, collective breath, deep sigh. We've reached the end of episode four and of this series. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed uh, the four segments and that you found them informative and that you've been intrigued enough by what I've been talking about to either try sake for the first time or to try it again, especially if your first experience with sake wasn't, let's say, stellar. Um, over the last four weeks, I've only touched on the world of sake. You know, there's so much more to discover and to taste. So don't be afraid to try something that we haven't talked about here over the last uh, couple of episodes. Um, 
and you know to really reach out and branch um, so if you find a style that is not to your liking don't hesitate to try again it's all subjective the more you try the more you're going to learn the more you're going to find stuff that you like if you'd like to learn more about sake or experience a guided tasting absolutely reach out to me either dm me on social media so facebook or instagram or my twitter um, or send me an email paul at psalmforall.com i offer a range of services including virtual guided tastings which are perfect for these extraordinary times um, you know, and they work great for friendly gatherings, corporate events, you know, and even fundraising events. So, you know, lots of opportunity with Psalm for All to guide and taste and learn. I also cover wine, beer, and spirits, just a reminder. So, you know, with Psalm for All, you can learn and taste it all. Lastly, I wish to sincerely thank you all for your time and your interest. Uh, whether you've been tuning in live, today's show live, or on the video replay, I very much appreciated all the kind comments that everyone sent through, you know, and that tells me that my approach and my style to these videos is really working. You know, it's great news to me, since my goal was to make the world of wine, beer, spirits, and, yes, sake, um, you know, accessible to everyone, regardless of a person's knowledge level. You know, that's kind of what I'm shooting for. You know, I, I, I want to help you all better understand what's in your glass and to help you all make better buying decisions in the future. Simply said, I truly want to be a psalm for all. Lastly, a loving and heartfelt thank you to my executive producer behind the camera. Without her dedicated assistance over the last four weeks, this September Saki Saturdays would not have been possible. And now, in a gesture of friendship, as we talked about in last week's episode, in the custom and tradition, I'm pouring a little bit of sake from my Takori into this Ochoco, and this is for all of you. My thanks to you for tuning in and for spending time with me. In these very uncertain and still extraordinary times, be safe, everyone. Be well. And cheers from Psalm for All.